Something we don't think about a lot when we consider our listening and effective listening skills is perception. Uh, but it's such a massive part of the entire listening process in terms of how we're choosing what to listen to and, and what we're going to hear that element of discriminative listening, right? And then how we perceive and shape those things in our own minds is, is really significant. So we're going to talk about perception and how it impacts listening. Um, specifically, we've been talking about listening through the Hurrier model, H U R I E R. And of course, each of those letters represents uh, a word there. So, you know, hearing, understanding, remembering, interpreting, evaluating, and responding are the different elements involved in the Hurrier model. Specifically with perception, we're going to focus on that element of hearing. And over the very first part of this process, hearing what are we choosing to listen to? How are we interpreting and shaping those sounds really? And just, you know, just that, that whole hearing process uh, as part of the listening process. And of course, you remember the Hurrier model kind of lays out like this with the, each of the uh, letters then representing a word that those, those different elements um, that are in there. So um, we have an entirely different mo a video on the Hurrier model. Feel free to check it out. But, uh, but this is where we're just placing perception within the hearing aspect of the listening process and the Hurrier model. Okay. So the process of perception, and there's a process for everything in communication, right? Everything breaks down into a process. So perception does have a very specific process. We go through different stages when we perceive something and it happens really, really quickly. So we don't always think about breaking it down in these nice little uh, nuggets, but, but, uh, but this is how it happens really. So we start with selection, essentially just deciding what we're going to pay attention to, which stimuli are we going to focus on and, and really allow our brain to and our and our senses to, to really focus on as part of that. So selection, what are we going to pay attention to? Then organization. How does this fit into our knowledge of the world, into the scope of things that we understand of the world? And, and how do we categorize these things just in kind of a broad sense? Then selection also does involve, of course, interpretation. How do we make sense of those things? And, and given our frame of reference, our culture, our background, our values, our knowledge, our history with these things, uh, interpretation plays a major factor. And then in many instances, we also get into negotiation where we're negotiating the reality of these things with other people and the perception of these things, you know, with other people, our perception, their perception, we're negotiating that. We're really going to focus on the first three stages here, the first parts of the process of perception, selection, organization, and interpretation in our discussion here. To start off, though, I'd like to ask you to, to do a little activity with me, okay? I really just want you to look at this picture and tell me what you see. That's it. What are you seeing? when you look at this, at this picture. Well, you may be noticing a couple of things. You hopefully you're seeing at least one thing, um, but you may be noticing that there are, hey, this is one of those images that actually has a couple of different things going on in it. Uh, you may be seeing what some people would describe as an older woman, like an old, old lady, right? Uh, maybe a witch or something. She's got a big nose and you're looking at her in profile. So you're seeing just the, the one half of her face. Um, it's got like a bonnet on or something like that. So you may be seeing that, but you may also be seeing an image of a younger woman. Well, people describe as a younger woman kind of looking away off into the distance. You're only seeing a part of her face. You're not seeing her full face, even in profile, uh, but she does seem to be younger, still kind of old fashioned or whatever. Maybe you're seeing both. That's okay. Whatever you're seeing is fine. There's no secret to this. I'm not trying to establish whether or not you're a serial killer or something by this. The, the point is that, um, um, that we see different things in this. We can see some people see both things. Some people see only one uh, until it's explained to them a little bit, but Whatever the case, you're going through the process of perception here. So the process of perception, as I said, starts with selection. So selection says, pay attention to this. This is what I want you to focus on. And I actually said that, and then I directed your attention to this picture. So selection had to do with you're paying attention to this picture and to what's going on here. You're not paying attention to what's on the TV or what you're trying to read or what you're going to do for dinner or those types of things. Your attention, your focus is right here right, on this image. That's selection. Organization looks at this and says, okay, that's a person. You know, for most of us, we look at it pretty quickly and say, that's a person, that's a face. That's, you know, I've seen people before. That's what they look like. That's what I'm looking at here. And so we know it's a, it's a, it's a person. It's not a cow. It's not a, an automobile. It's not, you know, a picture of a, the, the Amazon rainforest or anything like that. This is a picture of a person, an image of a person. We just categorize it generally like, okay, organization says this is a person. Then we get into interpretation. We start looking at some details here and we start saying, okay, if you're looking at the older woman, again, some people, first of all, the fact, is she old? Is she an old woman? 
And if so, is she a witch? Some people look at the kind of the bump on her nose and say, well, that's, that's something witches have, right? In the stories, they got that bump on their nose. So it's clearly she's a witch. And uh, so, but that's all interpretation based on what you're seeing and what your history is. And, you know, if you've had a lot of experience with witches, then maybe you see that. Or if you're seeing the younger woman, you know, your interpretation is first of all, A, that she's younger. We don't know that. We just, I mean, that's a personal interpretation. And and B, that she's old fashioned. We don't really know that. I mean, she's kind of dressed like that, but maybe it's for a, that she's playing a character in a play, or maybe she's going to a festival or something like that where she's dressed. So we don't really know what, you know, these things, but we make interpretations. Our mind kind of fills in those gaps based on our experiences, based on our knowledge, based on our understanding of the world. We make interpretations and we, and we jump to conclusions about these things as a matter of a, a course in trying to move the world along a little faster, right? And all of this happens just like that quickly. We go through selection, organization, interpretation, just about as quickly as we can blink or snap our fingers. We do all this kind of automatically and without really consciously thinking about it for the most part. And we do it instantaneously almost where we make these really quick judgments and, and get to these conclusions. Part of it's just a survival instinct. It's one of the, well, you know, as, as, as our you know, core human nature back in the day, we would need to immediately identify what's a predator uh, and what's potential prey for us, what, what's dangerous and what's not, what presents an opportunity and what presents a threat. Um, so, so we're in the habit of just making these snap decisions and, and jumping to these conclusions. But that's how perception works. We identify what it is we're going to pay attention to, then we generally categorize it. Then we start applying interpretation based on our own experiences and things. So now we know the process, but how does all this work? Where does all this come from? First of all, so let, let's take a look at some of the influences on perception. Some of the, some of the things that influence our perception of things. One of the, one of the key factors is access to information. What are you familiar with? What are you aware of in the world? What do you know about? Um, those things tend to be less sort of frightening for us in a sense, right? When we know something about it, then we tend to be less scared of it. But when we don't have access to that information, then it can be a little more tentative, right? If we're used to being around, um, you know, weapons, for example, if you're used to being around guns, you have access to that information, you've been taught how to properly handle a gun and use a gun and fire a gun and so forth then you're probably not going to be as nervous around it with somebody, you know, if you find yourself in a situation where somebody says, Hey, this is a gun, you want to go try it out. But if you don't, then that could be very frightening for you. If you come across a gun and you have no experience, no, inf no information about that previously, other than, you know, what you see in movies and, and reading books and things that can be scary. So access to information will influence our perception of something. Our physiological uh, aspects influence these things. So there are physiological influence, physiological, just meaning the body. So we're influenced by things that, that are related to our body. So for example, our senses influence how we perceive things. If, if, you know, and we know that if you have, uh, um, are, are somewhat limited in a particular sense, then that will affect your view of the world and the way that you engage with things and the way that you encounter things. If you have uh, limited eyesight or you're blind or you're, you know, um, I'd say I wear contacts and glasses. And if I don't have those, then I can't see anything. And that severely affect, you know, affects how I perceive the world if I can't see it, you know, if everything's blurry. Um, but you know, if we're, you know, we're thinking about all of our senses and if one of those is limited or one of them is particularly strong, that will affect uh, our perception of a situation. Uh, our age, we see things differently as, as we get older. Um, and, and you're not only your knowledge of the world changes, your information changes, your access to information, but your, you know, our bodies change and our senses change and all this kind of stuff. It's very different to experience something when you're five as opposed to when you're 75, right? So, uh, or even, you know, 35 or 55 or anything along those, those, and, and anything along that route is going to be different for you. So our age affects our perception of things, uh, our health and our fatigue. If we are, if we are sick or we are overtired, then that will affect our, or the way we perceive something, you know, our world kind of shrinks, right? When we're not feeling well, our world just kind of shrinks down to what's immediately in front of us. Uh, and when we're tired, we just don't see things as clearly and we perceive things differently. And so um, that's a physiological influence on our perception in general. Our biological cycles. Are you a morning person? Or are you an evening person? Uh, or a night owl, right? Then that will affect if you're a night owl and it's first thing in the morning and you haven't had your coffee or whatever, then your perception is probably not going to be as sharp. Right? And, and the same is true if you're if you're a morning person and it's getting later at night, you're, you're probably getting, your senses are going to be a little more dulled. Your perception is going to be different. Um, so our biological cycles in that regard will affect our perception as well. 
our hunger. Are we hungry? I mean, you get hangry, right? You're, you're, again, your, your, your perception narrows down to just what is it that's going to get me some food. So that can be a significant factor in perception as well. And then neurobehavioral challenges. If you have ADD, ADHD, um, uh, something like that, some sort of, um, uh, neurobehavioral um, issue, then, then that will affect your perception of the world, the way you see the world. Uh, autism, for example, is, is sort of a, a, a an extreme example of that, but it affects the way uh, we view the world. If you have some sort of social anxiety or, or something like that, then, then that would affect your perception and the way that you interact and the way that you see things. Right? So all of these different kinds of physiological influences that have to do with our body will influence our perception. Additionally, we can have some different psychological influences. Now we just talked about some ADD and things like that, but those are physiologically based, right? They are, they are physiological. They have to do a lot of times with our mind and things, but they really have to do with an imbalance in chemicals or something like that. Um, so it's, it's more of a physiological influence. When we talk about psychological influences, we're talking about things like our mood, you know, our mood just kind of settles in on us. We don't, we don't have any specific, it's not a triggered thing. Um, sometimes we just kind of wake up on the wrong side of the bed. You're in a good mood or you're in a bad mood or whatever that will affect our perception, how we view things, how we take things, right? Um, we're going to uh, you know, respond very differently depending on our mood. Uh, our self-concept is a psychological influence that also affects our perception as well. Right? That, that, that if we feel good about ourselves, then we're going to take something one way. And if we don't feel as good about ourselves, or if we have doubt about something, within ourselves, then we're going to take a comment or, uh, or a, when we're confronted with the situation, we're going to handle it very differently than we would otherwise. So we have these different psychological influences as well that affect perception. And as we cannot underestimate the, the role of so, social influences on perception, on perce right? So, um, these are extremely impactful as well. Things like sex and gender roles, our expectations for, you know, well, guys do this and women do that and, and you can't cross those over, right? And when we see a, a woman who's welding or we see a guy who's caring for a, a, an infant or something or doing laundry, then we look at that and we think, well, that's that can be strange, right? Because our social roles for sex and gender say, well, those are kind of, you know, and that's changing, of course, but those are different, right? They make them stand out and it affects our perception of that situation and of that person. Occupational roles. We spend a lot of time learning about a particular occupation and then actually performing that occupation when we're doing our work, right? We prepare for these careers and we work in these careers and that affects the way we see the world. One classic way to view this is if you have people walking through the woods, what would they interpret from that experience? So just to give you an example, my, I have two brothers. One is an educator and one is a pastor. And then of course I'm a, I'm a communication person. That's, that's my area of study. So if the three of us were walking through the woods, what kind of experience might we have just based on those heavy occupational views? So my brother, who's an educator, may be walking through, looking at things, saying, I wonder what kind of lesson plan I can get out of this, or what kind of field trip would be appropriate for the kids if I brought them out here? How can I use this to better their education? Because that's his mindset. He thinks about things through the view of an educator. My brother, who's a pastor, may be looking at things and thinking about, you know, wonderful God's creation is and how he might be able to use this to, to reach people and to, to factor it into a sermon for a lesson plan or something, you know, those types of things. Whereas I'm looking at, at the, at the woods thinking, okay, this to me is a system. It's amazing how this system works and it's interconnected. Cause I think in terms of organizational communication and, and how this, you know, how this, there's this symbiosis and this, this interaction between all these things in the system. And how can I use that to better my understanding of communication and to, to help others improve their communication as well. So, I mean, our occupational roles, play a major part in the way that we see the world. It affects our perception at all times that when we have these occupational roles. So anyway, another uh, social influence is relational roles. Things change dramatically when you become a parent. You see the world in a very different way. First of all, when you have, you have newborns and children, you know, toddlers and things, everything is a danger. Right. I can't tell you, I can't express to you that uh, as, and when I was younger, I saw nothing as a danger. I was invincible and so was everybody else. Right. But as soon as I became a parent, everything is a danger. <laughs> Every possible thing around your home is dangerous. And that's all you can see. And that's all you can do is worry about these kids for the next, you know, 50 years of your life. And, and those relational roles significantly change your perception of the world. And so when you're a parent, when you, we, we changes your view, when you're, you know, I have a big family, I have several siblings and I was saw that as different than uh, people who were uh, an only child or things. It just changes. And again, not a better or worse thing, but just 
different. Our perception of things was different. The way we viewed the world was different. So these kinds of relational roles will also influence your perception. And finally, we have these cultural influences. Um, our culture plays a significant impact in the way we view the world. Culture affects everything, of course, but um, but the way that we you know, we talk about culture meaning is made up of these um, symbols, um, language, values, and norms, and those are all significant impacts in the way we see the world and the way we perceive things. So uh, when we have people from different cultures, they will obviously perceive things in a very different way. So uh, now that we know the influences of perception, kind of where all this comes from, we throw all that in a blender and we come out with our perception of things and how we tend to see things. But, but we also have some common tendencies in perception. So I want to talk about those for just a second here. Some things that we tend to do that we need to be cautious of a lot of times. I mentioned this before, but snap judgments, we tend to jump to conclusions. We have these snap judgments. We see things and it's part of a survival instinct, but we got to be careful about not making these snap judgments or at least allowing for the fact that those snap judgments may not always be 100% correct, that we've got to allow for um, new information to come in and change our judgment, change our interpretation of a thing. Um, based on new information and new evidence and that we come across. And so we're going to make these snap judgments. We got to be careful of that and allow for new information as well. We got to be careful not to be overly reliant on first impressions. We tend to cling to these first impressions and, and how we perceive people from the first moment we meet them and, and maybe accurate in that moment. But you know, the, the moment that you meet somebody is not always the person that they are all the time right? For better or for worse. Then somebody may make a really good impression on you. And then over time, even though they turn out to be a jerk, it takes us a while to get there because our first impression is, is so strong. We hold on to that so strongly and vice versa. When somebody's a real jerk, when we meet them, maybe they're just having a bad day and they're really a good person, but, but we have trouble letting that go because that first time we met them, they were a real jerk. And so we got to be careful with first impressions. Uh, we tend to be more charitable to others, I'm sorry, to, to ourselves than others. So if you did poorly on a test, then it's probably because the professor's an idiot and asked poor questions and, you know, didn't prepare you very well, right? If somebody else did poorly on a test. It's probably because they didn't study as, as much as they needed to, right? If you did well and they didn't, you know, we just, as a natural tendency, we tend to be more charitable to ourselves. So we need to be cautious of that and be aware of that. Uh, we're also influenced by our expectations. This is, in fact, factors very much into what we would call self-fulfilling prophecy, that, uh, that kind of what we expect to see, our natural biases tend to have us see it that way or tend to, because we expect something to happen a certain way, we tend to kind of shape it that way in our mind and perceive it that way. Um, so we are influenced by our expectations. We need to be cautious of that. We also need to be cautious about not being influenced by the obvious. You know, just because that's what we saw doesn't mean that's the whole story. Doesn't mean that's what's happening. A lot of times we think about this in terms of, you know, the kids on the playground. And, and there's a, there's a, you know, scuffle going on. And by the, you know, by the time the teacher turns around and sees anything, they're only seeing that the last student push somebody down, right? But they didn't see all the stuff leading up to that. They didn't see the other student who got pushed in their opinion, calling names and pulling hair and pushing themselves and so forth. Um, but, but that teacher can only go on what they saw really. So they're influenced by the obvious. So that one student who did the, the push, maybe they did, only did that one thing and they were the one being bullied or one being whatever. But we're influenced by the obvious. We're influenced by what we see and what stands out to us the most. We also assume others to be like ourselves. Got to be careful of that. Not everybody is like us. It's a natural inclination to just assume that everybody is like you because, of course, you're in your right mind. And so everybody else who's in their right mind must be the same as you, right? Uh, but not necessarily. So we need to be cautious that we don't just make an assumption that everybody else is the same as us. So one thing we can do real, real simply, and this is really important in hearing too, in terms of, you know, if we're, if we're not hearing something, we're not sure what we're hearing, uh, we can, we can run what we call a perception check. And a perception check is just a really simple way to, to uh, identify that what we're hearing is correct and make sure we're hearing things correctly and understanding things correctly. And it's assertive, but it not, not aggressive. That's important too. So uh, when, we, when we think about a perception check, there are just really three simple steps to this perception check. First is to offer a description of the behavior, not an evaluation of the behavior, not a complaint about the behavior, just a description, a fact-based description of what is happening. Okay. Presumably this is a behavior that, that, uh, that, that you had identified as something that wasn't going to happen anymore. And it is, or something like that, but you're just providing a description of the behavior in a factual sense. Then you're going to offer two possible interpretations of that behavior. 
And it's important that there be two of them because, first of all, that opens the door to say to the other person, you know, even if it's not either of these two things that you're open to, you know, I'm not sure what's going on here. I need you to explain it to me. I need you, I need more information. So it, it just isn't made like a statement of fact as though you know what's going on and the other person is wrong and so forth. That would be more aggressive. But this is assertive. You're identifying something that's happening that you need to follow up on, and you're offering two possible interpretations and identifying those, as, but also opening the door then because there are two to say, you know, it could be these things, it could be something else, I don't know. And then finally, just a request for clarification to say, what's happening? What's going on here? Can you explain this for me or to me? Can you help me out with this? So if we take the example of, you know, if you have two neighbors, right, you have neighbors and one neighbor has um, uh, a shrub that keeps growing over, you know, some bushes that they keep letting grow over a tree or something, they keep letting grow over the fence uh, across the yard or whatever. And so maybe this is something you've talked about with your neighbor before. I, I need you to, you know, if you, you and they've agreed. Yeah, I'll maintain that and I'll keep it from, you know, affecting your yard by coming through the fence or over the fence or whatever. And, and I'll help with, help you with that. Uh, but then it starts to happen again. You know, it's, it's happened now a couple times and it's happening again. So you, you want to address it with the, with the neighbor, but you don't want to be aggressive. You got to live with this person next to this person, right? So you don't want to be overly aggressive, but you want to really get this fixed and find out what's happening. So you might go to that person and run a perception check. You might say to them in a description of the behavior, Hey, you know, I, you know, if, if you recall, we talked uh, a few months ago about, you know, maintaining the, the, um, the plants and the, the bushes and the trees and things on either side of our fence so that it doesn't grow over in the other person's yard and create a, a problem there. And we talked about that and we had both agreed to do that in the past. And, but it's happening. I see that this is happening again. So that's a description of the behavior, right? You're not saying, Hey, jerk, get your plant off of my fence and so forth. You're, you're just describing this is what happened in the past. This is what we agreed to. And now this is factually what's happening now, right? So you're just laying out the facts. Then you're going to offer two possible interpretations and say, I, I just, I didn't know if you'd forgotten that we had that conversation or if I didn't know if you'd just been really busy and haven't been able to do that and been able to, to maintain that. So I just want, and then a request for clarification. I just wanted to check in with you see what, see what was happening with that, uh, with that, that plant or that bush or that tree or whatever. Um, and it opens up that dialogue though, really. It opens it up in an assertive way, but not in an aggressive way. The other person feels trapped in a corner and, and so forth. So hopefully it opens up that dialogue so that you can start that conversation and then continue to, to work towards a solution. That's it. That's a simple perception check. And I know it sounds really kind of simple and silly, but it actually works. It's very effective in these types of situations. So if you're in a situation where you actually don't know what's happening and you need to check your perception in that regard, or you want to bring up a sensitive topic, but not be aggressive about it because that can more often lead to conflict than anything else. Right. And that's not going to be necessarily beneficial. So you want to come to some sort of assertive, um, reasonable solution to this. A perception check can be a great way to do that. It can be a great way to do that. Okay. But in any case, Perception is such a massive part of, of the hearing process and the listening process overall. When we have these stimuli come in through selection, we're selecting, we're, we're discriminatively listening, we're paying attention to this. Then we go through the perception process when we hear these things at the, at the first thing we do is trying to organize and interpret this information. And so that's why we're including this in the hearing aspect of the Hurrier model, because it really does happen at the very, very initial outset of the listening process along with this. So I hope you can see how perception fits in here um, with listening overall and particularly with hearing. If you have questions about perception, about hearing, about listening, about any of this, please feel free to email me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that you will give great consideration to your own perception, the way that your perception affects these different things and, and, uh, and plays a role in the listening process. So the better that we understand that, the closer we are to becoming a more effective listener.